future is here. You now have the power to unlock the secrets of the hobby. An innovation that will change the way the industry works. The game changer is here. Card Ladder. Hey everyone, this is Josh back with Cardboard Chronicles, and today I'm joined by actor, producer, and owner of Dope, Rob G. How's it going, Rob? Great. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for joining. So Rob recently purchased the most expensive sports card in history when he bought the 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle PSA 9 for $5.2 million. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But first, Rob, why don't you start us off, just tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe your background in the hobby. Yeah, so I mean, I'm originally from Indianapolis, um, started collecting as a young kid uh, in the early 90s, cheap packs, it didn't come from much money, just, you know, trying to just pull cool things that, you know, you love as a kid. And then I got out of the hobby. And uh, August of, of 2020, I got back in. And um, initially, was kind of skeptical, wasn't, you know, didn't really know what I was getting into. And then obviously, once you jump in, you get addicted. And you realize how much fun the hobby is. And, and, um, and boy, I, I got the bug bad. And I just started, you know, living and breathing the hobby. And, um, and that's what happened. So that was August of 2020. And, and just been deep since, just loving it. What brought you back in specifically? Was there like a card or a sale maybe you saw? Or like what, what piqued your interest? No, just uh, um, some guys reached out and said, hey, um, you know, we've been buying and we got into this hobby. Um, you know, their kind of sales pitch where, hey, the prices are going crazy. And I think they'll continue to go crazy because there's more and more people come in, supply and demand. Um, and so therefore the supply stays the same and demand will continue to rise and, and the prices will continue to go up. So that was there, I guess, initial, you know, that was kind of, I guess, what initially piqued my, my interest. And then as you obviously dive in, there's just so much more to it than an investment um, side of it. Yeah, what, what cards did you start with when you first got in? You know, I jumped in with a diversified portfolio, um, some current basketball, um, you know, because it's, for me, it's like a penny stock. You know, I looked at it, my portfolio of cards is like a portfolio of stock. So I did current, I did vintage, basketball I did current and vintage baseball um and then that's that was mainly it and then I also did some wax um some vintage wax and then I've uh, since then I've progressed and bought you know some some soccer some you know other things but uh, some football but initially it was just current and vintage both baseball and basketball and some yeah, wax so then talk about the mantle, like maybe talk about your, your history with the card and what, what you like about it. And then what, like the process of trying to obtain one and, and actually buying one. Yeah. You know, I mean, as a kid, that was, that was the pinnacle card. That was the most iconic card. You know, I didn't honestly know what Honus, who the Honus Wagner card was. I never even heard of that as a kid. Um, but Mickey Mantle, this particular card was the iconic card then. So, you know, I had a, a reprint I found it, my mom sent me all my cards and I had the reprint in a, um, one of those glass massive, like the biggest glass case I had as a kid, you know, that was, that was the, the special card for me, the, the reprint, you know? And so when I got back in, initially I was buying, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just buying things, you know, trying to play the market. And, and then I, and when I got hooked, I'm, I'm like, I gotta have this card. This is, <laughs> this is the card. Um, so I bought a PSA five. And I was super pumped about it. I mean, I was like, this is amazing. And it was hard to even come with that. A lot of people don't, these are, I would say even the fives and the fours and those kind of things are pretty in, in strong hands. It's not like a Zion where people are just flipping them every day. So I bought a five, super pumped. And then, um, then I bought a six, a six came available. So I bought a six. And uh, again, I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> Um, so then I was talking to a good friend, Steve Aoki, who's, who's also in the card game now. Um, and he's like, dude, that's my favorite card. I got to have one. 
So I sold it to him for what I paid for it because just to, you know, so he can get his car. And then I bought, then I started looking at the data of the card and realized that this card hasn't really popped like all the other cards have um, in the past two years. You know, if you look at the Jordan uh, rookie or even the Gretzky or the Jackie Robinson or the LeBron, I mean, shit, LeBron was a thousand bucks in October of 19. And then now it's 27 grand. That's, a, that's crazy. Um, the same with the Jordan rookie, all these other things. Whereas the, the mantle didn't, it didn't pop. So I'm starting to, you know, really do um, dive into the data and, and, um, and it just made a sense. So then I bought the eight and, um, and that at the time, that was definitely my highest price point. That same time I bought the eight, I bought a, a Babe Ruth rookie 1916 Sporting News uh, SGC4. I mean, I, I had millions of dollars in cards already, but those were like the two largest purchases um, from an individual card standpoint. So I purchased both those the same I think the same day, two different auctions or something, but, and then, um, then I have four, I bought a four and at the same time, I'm just hunting for that nine going, dude, I got to get the nine or the 10. I got to get it. And, you know, I've got great relationships with, you know, most of the auction owners, um, or the business development for the auction owners and a bunch of other different, um, you know, car dealers. And, and then Jesse at PWCC, um, you know, said, Hey, we've got the best mantle one, you know, the fourth best for sure, uh, in the world. Um, and, and it could be arguably that it's, it's better than some of the tens, but we've got on our vault. These, these things never become available and, um, or, you know, never become for sale. Normally they don't want to sell it. So we talked about, I said, you know, we, you don't get what you don't ask for, you know, you don't, you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Let's, let's take the shot. And he did. And, and he worked it out with the, with the seller, he or the owner of the car at the time, he worked it out to um, allow him to to get him to sell. So um, we negotiated. Obviously, you know the, the price starts higher. I go a lot lower, and, and we negotiated and come to the the five point two million dollar price. But um, that's that's basically it. That's the uh, that's how I got it. I mean, it, it was a few days of negotiating, and you know it's a massive purchase, especially for my side. That was the biggest purchase I made. Well, I guess it's the biggest purchase anybody's made. Um, so, you know, I, I was trying to analyze the data and make, and, um, and rationalize it in my own head. And, uh, and then finally I just pulled the trigger. So it's awesome. I mean, the, the yeah. PSA nine is only a pop six. Cause you think in that vintage stuff, people kind of assume that the nine pop is just a lot higher than the 10 for most things. And it is, but for that card specifically, the nine is almost equal to the 10 and its population. So it's, it's, it's pretty rare still. It's not like there's a bunch of nines floating around. No, it's super rare. I mean, I'm sure you know the story about the 52 tops and how they, they dumped a lot of them in the river and how, you know, back then, you know, kids would put them in their bicycle spokes or, you know, it wasn't like they didn't think about let's collect this. It, you know, it was let's have fun with it, you know. Um, so to have it in such pristine position, um, you know, condition is it's insane. The card in person, it's it's pretty it's pretty it's a, it's a beautiful card so yeah it's it's a great great card so did you get the the brinks truck treatment or did it go did it just stay in the vault no i had them deliver it um so they definitely brought it in an armored truck and uh and the two security guards um and the same you know it's just right now it's you know i, I feel more comfortable in the vault so you know it's same delivery out of here um send it back in a in a thing but you know wanted to wanted to you know hang with it and see it in person and feel it and touch it you know i had to yeah i just had to so definitely wanted to see it for a while can you talk about that real quick because i i think you know there's a lot of talk about like comparing it to crypto and then now there's like some new avenues where people are selling digital cards talk about just like you wanting to actually hold the card and is there something that's interest to you about cards that, that because it is a physical actual asset. 100. Yeah. For me, you know, I collect art as well. Um, I think, yeah, that, that's part of it. You know, that, I think mean, that's why the, the fun of collecting cards, it's, it's fun to get it in the mail. It's fun to pull it out, look at it. Um, for me, that tangible product is cool. Um, I do know that, yeah, like you said, the crypto cards or, you know, the, bit, or the, um, you know, those online cards are definitely crushing and, and going, 
going haywire. But for me, it's it's definitely more of the the touch and feel. This particular card for me, it's 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 art, you know, and and that's how I look at it. It's um, this is definitely art. It's just a rare piece of of um, of art. Yeah, totally. Especially something of that caliber. Um, so you touched on like the investment side of it a little bit. And obviously you're not, you're not planning on like throwing away this amount of money. So like what, what about this card or maybe this industry or the hobby gives you confidence that, you know, your money's actually well spent and you're, and it's not just about the collecting. You know, I looked at it, um, the data from in the past, 2016, you had a spike, you, you dipped soon after, you know, I always look at the history and, and how do we not repeat ourselves? And is it going to repeat itself? Because before I'm going to infuse a ton of money, obviously I want to make sure that I'm not just buying something that's worthless, you know? So if you look at then, I didn't see a lot of news coverage. I didn't see celebrities getting into it. You know, I saw a few wealthy individuals buying certain cards, pumping the values up for those. And, and that's where I think you saw the massive spike in the dip. Whereas now, um, you know, you see it in the news every single day, which is crazy. You see celebrities and athletes and all these people posting about it on their social channels, um, you know, that is going to continuously drive incremental new people. And the more and more new people come in again, more demand, same supply, and it just drives the price up. So for me, I thought that was, um, I thought this particular time that it had, it had good legs to go forward. Also, if you look at, you know, 75% of the, of the cash in the market, it was made in the last 10 years. It's a lot of cash being produced in the last 10 years. So I'm also thinking that the next you know, 24 months to the next decade, you're going to have a lot of, of people putting money into rare assets. Um, and I think the prices on those kind of things are just going to skyrocket over the next hopefully decade. So what's your plan with the actual hobby side of things? Because I think, I don't know if you've sensed this so far in your time in the hobby, but there's there's always been sort of this uh, awkward divide of like investor versus collector. And there's some obviously like gray area there, but what's your plan maybe going forward with your involvement in the actual hobby side versus the investment side? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm definitely in the hobby side. You know, I didn't really, I'm not buying a lot of things because I want to flip them. Um, so when I, I'm not going to say that when I first jumped in, that's not why I jumped in, but you know, now I think I've pivoted to the more hobby, um, aspect of it. Now, not, do I love that my portfolio of cards have, have risen tremendously? Of course. I mean, who, who wouldn't love that? But, you know, for me, it's, it's more so about, I really love collecting these things and I've really caught the bug doing that. Um, I think I would love to join the hobby in a much deeper basis. I'm trying to figure out what what the best allocation of my time and uh, resources would be for the hobby. But, um, you know, if you can do what you love to, and make money on it, you know, it's not really a job. So I would love to figure out some kind of way. And I'm, I'm looking at different opportunities and, and seeing what the best fit would be. Um, I just want something, whatever I do to also be a way to drive the hobby to the, you know, to the, to new levels. And that was the whole, you know, excitement for me on this, the news thing, you know, I, I was excited because now a lot of people saw this story that maybe didn't know what the hobby was. They didn't know that cards were, you know, I had so many friends reach out and go, Oh my God, you're collecting cards. Like what, what's this all about? And that for me was exciting to get maybe new eyeballs into the hobby, at least to consider this, uh, this, this thing that we both enjoy. Yeah. And it's a, it's a diversified asset class, you know, and I, I just, I think people have missed that, that this is a good investment. Um, so I think maybe they'll, they'll notice that a little more now. You're jumping into my next topic kind of smoothly here. The, um, and I think this question is really directed for yourself and, and guys like yourself, but you, you kind of touched on it. There's like a shift from it being, um, you know, just a hobby and now it's becoming a little bit more mainstream and it's a little bit cooler. Uh, is there is there like a future in cards in terms of like a cultural stay and, and especially like American culture? I know you have like paintings, you have fashion, clothing, shoes. Do you think cards are kind of shifting into that sort of realm? I think so. I mean, you know, let's use my analogy is all these like sports guys, you know, they collect, they collect shoes or they're signed with Jordan or whatever. You know, if you're signed with Jordan, why wouldn't you have a Jordan rookie PSA 10? 
you know, especially if you're making, I look at all these athletes as, as essentially venture capitalists, you know, they're, they are making massive amounts of money. So for them to allocate a million dollars or a small piece of their portfolio into cards when, you know, it's a sport that they play, it's a sport that they love, uh, they know it better than anybody. Why wouldn't they put money behind this, you know, this thing that they love? And the reason why vintage for me is important because if they do start doing that, which they are coming in more and more, are they gonna buy their competitors? Are they gonna buy their peers? You know, I, I would imagine if I was, you know, a star athlete, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy myself um, and I'm gonna buy, you know, vintage legends. Um, you know, I'm not gonna buy the guys I'm playing against. You know, maybe I'm gonna buy a couple speculative plays. Um, but yeah, so I, I do think it, it, it's gonna be something that people just start buying just because, you know, it's cool. Yeah. What about like the cultural side of like, you know, the, the common, the common person that where they'd sort of like integrate it into their cultural lives of maybe how art is today, where it's, it's a part of their mantelpiece at home, or it's like a talk, talking point in regular day to day. Do you, do you see us getting to that point? I hope so. I, uh, yeah, I think so. You know, yeah, I think there's so many ways that that makes sense and why people will start to do it. And, and it's happening as, as people see it more. I mean, how many times do you just have random friends that, you know, I haven't been in as long as you, but you know, before they probably thought you were crazy and now they're seeing it on the, on the television or whatever, they're probably bringing it up in conversation more and more to you, or maybe listening to you more. And, uh, and I think that'll continue to go. And, and, you know, especially as it's just, they see it on, on different celebrities, Instagrams, they're going to start talking about it, you know, and maybe when they're, they're watching sports and talking with their buddies about sports, maybe they're going to bring up, Oh yeah, did you see this guy's car go crazy? The prices are nuts. Um, so I definitely think it's, it's going to continue to see, be driven into the society. Yeah. It's, it's coming up more and more in daily conversation, especially in my life. I mean, I'm, so I'm obviously running, I run a small business for, for card ladder, uh, you know, where we're providing data for the hobby and all these things. Oh, by the way, uh, we ran the, the 52 manual PSA nine through our system and we came up with 5.5 million as our prediction. Okay. Got it. So you guys can predict value. We're using a uh, correlated data based on other cards that are in the market that do sell more frequently. And we base it on multipliers and, and we sort of like corner it to see exactly how it relates to other things. And, you know, we, we run it through several different comparisons. It's not, and it goes back all time sales history. So we're not just looking at recent things. We're not just looking at one card. Uh, so it's pretty accurate over time and we've had pretty good success with it. And we came up with 5.5. And so, I mean, I think, you know, you're, you're definitely in the right range. I mean, the same day that it was announced, I got an offer for six mil. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, that's great. You got a good, you, you know, had the, I, I think it's even more valuable than that. I mean, based on the data that I was crunching, but that's great. You came in higher than me. That means I did. Okay. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We like to, we like to show the predicted values, especially when like big cards come up for auction at golden and stuff. We like to put it into our system to see how accurate we are with each, with, with each one that comes up. And that one was a fun one to run. Um, That's incredible. So in your, in your time in the hobby so far, you, you've probably seen some things maybe that uh, you said, you mentioned you wanted to get more involved. What, what are some things that you think could be improved in the hobby? Uh, like really could be, could be anything, whatever you think. Well, I mean, obviously PSA, I uh, hope that this transaction makes the speed of of grading go up. I think that needs to obviously um, be updated. You know, there's so many things, you know, I mean, are cards graded by a human? Um, is that the best way? I, I don't know. I think that could be something to be looked at because, you know, if you send in a, a card multiple times, it could get a different grade. And, um, or you, you know, you, you crack it out of one case, submit it to another, or you just send it in in another case and you submit it. Um, maybe they don't even regrade it because it's coming from a competitor. So I, I think, um, you know, that could be more, I, you know, fixed, I guess, a little bit better. Um, I think companies like you and VCP and those kind of guys, I think that's a, a you know, great tools that um, I definitely use on a daily basis. Um, you know, I, uh, I don't know, you know, I've had some problems with eBay, you know, the prices have been fluctuating so fast that you buy something and then maybe the seller 
doesn't ship because the price went up. Um, I bought a PSA 10 Jordan sticker, 1986 sticker from this guy on um, some lawyer, I think in Michigan named Timothy. And, uh, you know, he just, I, I won the, the card fair and square. And, and then he, you know, he didn't ship it and said, oh, problem shipping. And then he reposted it for double the amount. Um, you know, I just think shady things like that really hurt the hobby. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, th I think it's going in the right direction. I love that uh, new money is coming into it and, and new infrastructure. Um, insurance, you know, I'm looking at insurance, you know, for me to insure my collection, you, you know, you use the vault companies or you can use, um, you know, the same thing as art, like Chubb. Um, you know, so I think that's an opportunity to figure that out, to make it easy for people to, to insure their, their goods. Because a lot of these guys that are buying these cards, they never had you know, they never had money like this before. They never had a big art collection. They don't know that you should have insurance or how to insure something. So I think um, having those kind of things, you know, I think lending on the cards is a, uh, is a massive opportunity in the space. You know, um, if you have a house or, you know, you have art, you can, you can borrow against those assets. And I'm not sure if there's anything that's uh, that's live now where you can borrow on your, on your card collection. I think that's a, that's a good opportunity to, to allow people to write bigger checks and to, you know, use their card value to, to keep growing their own, uh, their own assets. So I think there's a lot of opportunities out there if, if, um, to really make this hobby better and to grow it. More money coming into the sport just means the card values go higher. What are your thoughts on the uh, fractional shared, like the, you know, group collecting? Yeah, I think it's incredible to be honest, you know, I mean, it allows, it allows people that maybe they wouldn't have an opportunity to own a piece of these assets to now have a piece of it. Um, and it also allows the high end owners to maybe share their collection, um, but also still retain a piece of it for the upside. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I think it's a good way, good disruptive space. Yeah, totally, man. Uh, last question. Um, you've been in the hobby for a little bit and you've, you've kind of, you've figured out, you know, some of these, like the mantles, the Jordan rookies, is there any, is there anything that stands out to you as you've dug in more, maybe like more stuff that a lot of people don't know about or rare cards or like different things that have interest you, you know, over time, is there anything that, that comes to your mind there? Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you. So I bought a uh, 1984 star 101 Jordan card, but a PSA eight, so, you know, I like that card because PSA stopped grading those cards a long time ago. But before they did, they graded nine cards. And so I love that. You know, if you look at 1986 Fleer, they're, they're still box breaking. You know, they just broke a box the other day. Three Jordans came out of it. So the pop report is going to continue to rise. There's 317 or so with PSA 10s. And, you know, you can still add more to that. So I love this because 1984 was really Jordan's first year. Um, the star 101 card. So I love that. And I love that there will be the, the pop report will not increase. I love that it's got such a unique story behind it. You know, some people would say, oh, that's, uh, you know, a Beck at eight or a Beck at nine, the value should be the same. But I highly disagree with that. I think that, you know, the PSA pop report is, is important. And if they couldn't tell the difference between a fake and so much that they're not going to grade it, how the hell is Beckett saying, you know, at the time, especially that these are legit, you know? So I think that's just like a cool, rare um, card that um, that I think is one of the, the cooler rare cards that, um, that I like. Yeah. Just, there's only nine of them. And in the ninth, yeah. the PSA nine, I think it's got qualifiers. I think it's an OC. So that's why the eight, you know, it's just a, cool unique card i try to get them to re-slab it and they won't they say we sorry we don't re-slab uh star cards but are you yeah, uh, are you addicted are you addicted yet oh bro i'm way over addicted i mean I'm, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you do. i mean yeah I'm, I'm definitely addicted that's for sure yeah, yeah. i uh, i can i can sense it in your voice here the late night ebay trying to find random stuff guy <laughs> oh yeah i mean there's not a day that goes by that i don't buy something it's crazy it's absolutely crazy um yeah but it's you know it's a lot of fun all right well i appreciate your time today i'm glad people got to see 
the the broader picture of like how you approach the the collecting game and, and not just the the mantle. So I appreciate your time and thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Honored to be here. Thank you so much.